Okay, welcome back everybody. And uh, thanks for submitting all the proposals. I'm reviewing and the categorize all of them together, okay? So we will chat about the, the proposals. Once I finish reading all of them, I'll give some feedback. Then we're gonna group everybody into mini groups with similar technique, similar scope. Then we will run a couple of those experiments in November, as I mentioned. I'll give everybody some feedback. My, if you really wanna go for uh, proposals for a national lab or something outside USN, I'll give you some good feedback on that. So now we're moving on to the next part of our discussion about X-ray scattering. So the next up and coming part, we're gonna chat about um, how to measure a couple samples. What is the science case we can do? I has been reading and trying to give a good sense of what the book, the textbook is talking about. It's, it's pretty good, but it's a little bit dated. You know, it chatted most about liquid crystalline material, polymer micelle, et cetera. So I'm gonna do something slightly different. I saw it will be more engaging and show everybody some more unique data uh, or more modern data once we talk about those. So I'll do following to discuss about the science example. That's my plan. So the plan is we're going to start by talking a little bit about what we have in environment and what we can do here at USN. Then I'll talk about what I did in my PhD and postdoc and I'll show a little bit more detail how we collect the data and how we analyze data from the beginning because we have the raw data other than showing one abstract or so. I'll send uh, the relevant publications to everybody, so you can. You are welcome to read in advance, but if you don't, if you are not um, have time, that's okay, because we're just going to go through a couple papers, talk about what techniques we did in their papers, etc. Specifically, we will cover the following topics. We will cover block polymer assembly as the first topic. So how micro domains can be characterized by x-ray. Um, in this part, it's actually relevant to x-ray diffraction. Um, block of polymer forms something we call the um, polymer crystals-like structure because it forms spherical packed domains or cylindrical packed domain. So we will show a few examples how we can get those kind of domains and how x-ray scattering can be done. Um, other than that, we will talk about how we can get the structure, how we monitor order disorder transition. Okay, so something from disorder state to order state. How can we measure and monitor in real time? So we will chat about that as well. Um, other than block of polymer, we will then talk about crystalline structure in polymer film. Um, I decide to Focus a little bit more because that I think is more important and relevant to everybody's research. Semi-crystalline structure. We're gonna talk about what happens in classical material like polyethylene, etc. Then goes into some of the area I worked a lot, which is conjugate polymer, crystallized structures in synfilm and in bulk. We will show everybody what the example out there. Okay. So the other one I saw a lot of interest from the common group is polymer composites, especially nanocomposites, how, you, how the filler would impact your polymers, morphology, et cetera. For that particular topic, um, we, we are fortunate enough to have invited to talk, as I mentioned to everybody, um, Professor Michael Hoare uh, from uh, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, he works on nanoparticle assembly, nanoparticle interfaces with polymer. So he will talk about that. So then I has been thinking about what would be the other things interesting to everybody. We haven't chat too much about form factor. So the next um, sort of after nanoparticle and nanocomposite, we will talk about polymer in solution. Um, that's relevant to a lot of work we 
we're interested to look at a single polymer chain conformation in solution, and then we're going to trend it to polymer micelles. Uh -huh. This is also a big topic in the polymer community, polymer electrolyte, polymer micelles in solutions, or biomolecular in solution. That will be the last. Then I'll leave one topic uh, open, and uh, after those four topics, I'm happy to chat any topics that uh, any of you are interested. Um, if there is no more specific mention, I'll just uh, quickly cover what the textbook talked about. Uh, they talked about, similarly, some of them are a little bit over that, but they talk about liquid crystalline polymer, they talk about micelles, they talk about block polymer assembly. Um, I will just brief mention, help you go through the textbook. But I think it's, it will be better listening to my science case. I'll show you the example, okay? And only after this, after four or five lectures, the only thing left that we haven't touched is polymer thin film and uh, interfaces problem. So if you look at the textbook, there's one last chapter that talk about thin film. And we're going to cover a little bit today, which is basically talking about uh, X-ray reflectometer and uh, gradings and X-ray scattering. Okay. Uh, we will talk just in a few minutes once we get into the section that relevant to the thin film sample. But um, I could uh, add one more section to just to talk about reflectivity um, if, if time allows after those five, six lectures uh, talking about application. Okay? That's the general plan for October. Any questions? Okay, so my plan is by the mid to late October, once we had, uh, I have read everybody's topic, we will um, group everybody, as I mentioned. Then I want everybody, after listening to all the topics, science example, then revisit your proposals. We're probably going to divide into three, four groups. Then I want everybody to make a mini presentation about your topic and uh, what techniques you're going to use, what the science you can get out of it. So a quick short, it don't need to be long, probably five slides to just to tell everybody what you are generally working on. Then we're going to go into November, which is hands-on session. For this hands-on session, we're going to need some help from my student, especially Guorong, who is helping with uh, x-ray instrument management. So we're going to divide it into small groups and use the uh, class time from probably Tuesday, Thursday morning time, from 8 to noon-ish, to go there and run experiment. Um, so in that case, if you are in the group, you are assigned to go, you should have come. Otherwise, I think we don't need to assemble, okay? Other, if, only if you are interested in that particular technique, you might want to learn more. That's always good. So you can feel free to join other teams and watch their experiment. So the November will mostly hands-on. We're going to collect the data and I will reserve the last week or so to go through how to use the software to analyze the data. That's always the tricky part, um, just because like anything you learn, you're gonna repeat a couple of times, a couple of weeks until you're really familiar or get up to speed. Similar like learning swimming or biking, so practice is the key once we go through the, um, the software. And I hope everybody will be able to um, be fully self-sufficient and able to to x-ray work. So today's topic gonna be, goes a little bit deeper. We talk about science, but one part, um, let me go back, just go back to my slide that everybody sh have saw. So in here, we have chatted mostly about source, optics, environment, but we haven't go really deep into what's the environment available there. So today's first part, we will talk chat about what we actually have in USN and what can we do with them, okay? So first, a disclaimer, some of the slides were made by Luke and Song while we were doing the x-ray work, so thanks to them for getting some of the hands work on here and taking the picture, et cetera. 
So all the sample environment happens here in this tiny chamber. This is about, um, I would claim, maybe one and a half feet by one and a half feet by two feet tall. So it's reasonable big box and where all the sample mounting and sample, um, sample calculation happens. So Linux provided a couple wide range of sample environment. So I'll go through each of them. They offers a very interesting system that they has a magnetic mounted base plate. So this is a, um, this is a metal piece but in the other part, we have a male and female part. So when they connect, they have a magnetic force that's fo uh, hold it in place. So we can just pick the sample stage and put on there. That's pretty straightforward. The solid sample is typically used to, to measure solid sample, as the name indicates. What you are looking at is a grid of hole pattern. So this is a five of holes, and they're comb shaped. And anyone have a guess why we have to make them cone shaped? Why not just a straight hole? Right? If you look at it carefully, it may not be clearly here, but uh, the slide is in the canvas if you want to take a closer look at your own laptop. If you look at here, on the other side, actually, um, it may or may not be the cone shaped. Anyone? So does the X-ray enter through the more narrow opening and then does it come into account for the scattering? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's to accommodate wide angle scattering angle. So if you have a very narrow exit angle, you're going to have the beam actually being uh, blocked by your sample holder. So this is particularly useful for wide angle scattering. And uh, as you can see, there's still going to be some blockage because sample is not sitting outside it. So sample is sitting in between these pieces of metal where you can think about a plastic, uh, a washer you get from the Home Depot. It's basically, there is a hole in the middle and there is a certain thickness of the wall in that piece of metal. If you're just putting this hole there, you're not going to be able to hold your sample because it's a through hole, right? So typically we put in some Thin films of poly, um, we call it a captum or polyimide on both sides to hold the sample there. Polyimide is um, very useful just because it's pretty much inert to a lot of chemical environment. And it can hold on, can be heated at relatively high temperature. If you're doing temperature dependent, it's also useful. So. A lot of time, people use that yellowish tape to put the, there to hold the sample. But uh, you can use any of the sample as long as they don't scatter strongly. The other one people used are uh, quad slides can be used, and we will talk a little bit about liquid sample here. Um, just a second. So other materials are some of the application. For example, if you really worry about Capton scattering or absorption. The other options are uh, silicon nitride window. It's a very thin layer of inorganic material. Can go as thin as 100 nanometer. It's, it's going to be brittle, but you know it's uh, it serves the purpose of giving a, a amorphous weak background. Okay. So what are you going to do typically for these? Uh, load the solid samples in there. Sandwich in between put them there so you can mount as many as about 15 samples and you can measure one by one or you can program it such that it can measure you know, by itself after you set up the computer program. Thin film sample, um, it looks a little bit weird geometry but the purpose of this is basically once you put the, put the film here you can actually lie it flat so when x-ray comes in it's shooting at a great instant angle. They actually don't need to mount the top part. The reason they made it sort of cut away is you can mount sample here or here. So you can mount great instance from the bottom or shoot it from the top if you glue the sample to the top part. But almost every time we mount in the bottom, just leave it flat there. This is a 
also useful, liquid sample. So when you want to measure in liquid, clearly you cannot put in capton tape here there because liquids might erode into your capton uh, adhesives and get leaked out, right? So this is the most commonly used. What we use is what we call the capillary tube setup. So it's not typical capillary tube. It's specialized by a company and it's apparently only vendor to provide this. So what they do is they use glass blowing techniques to make very, very thin wall of um, capillary tube. The wall thickness is typically on the order of 10 micrometer. Okay, so your hair is 200, so it's much, much thinner than your hair. Um, pretty fragile if you squeeze it pretty strong, it's gonna shatter. Um, however, this is the diameter of this tube. Um, diameter is about somewhere between one millimeter or 1.5, depends on your order. So very tiny capillary tube. You can load the liquid in it and use something to seal on top, such as wax or epoxy. So you can have pretty liquid environment you can measure. In this case, you, you can just measure them horizontally. Okay, one by one. Heating stage is something um, we also acquire the ability. This is a slightly busy um, graph, but in a, in a short sense, heating stage and tensile stage were sort of third party accessories added to it. It was not manufactured by the Xenox, but they partner with a company called Lincoln Scientific Instrument. Lincoln is a small company started in uh, UK. I actually had a colleague who has been x-ray scattering for almost 50 years at Oak Ridge. So he was a lead, scientific lead at the ESRF, uh, Synchrotron at Europe. So he was the one initial, in, had initial discussion with the Lincoln, the founder of that company. He's still alive. He's in his 90s who started this Lincoln stage. It's a pretty good business. Um, anyway, they make good scientific instruments, although it, on, a little bit on the expensive side, a heating cooling stage um, is on the order of $30,000 with a controller stage. But you can go as low as uh, what liquid nitrogen allows you, roughly minus 100 degree to uh, 70, or minus 70 degree, depends on how much liquid nitrogen you're pulling in there. Um, they have the controller, so you can control the temperature profile. You can control heating rate, cooling rate, and the high temperature depends on the setup, but it can go as high as 600 degrees Celsius, okay? We have a setup here. We have commonly used them to measure uh, polymer um, degree of crystalline at different temperature. So it can load the sample. In two ways, you can do it in powder form. Again, it needs to be sandwiched. So that's a little bit tricky because once you melt, then it's gonna flow. So you wanna make sure it does not flow out the cell and mess up the instrument. So more commonly, when we need to heat up at the melting point, we use again. It, this one can take a, a capillary tube as well. You just put in a capillary tube. And then insert this particular capillary tube inside here. It has a pore to accept it from the side. And lastly, but not least, it's a tensile stage where you can measure tensile deformation of your sample um, while measuring the scattering information. So in our group, Daniel Weller, a senior graduate student, used it most. He worked on a strain-induced crystallization project. So he looks at how does polymer um, strain uh, crystallize upon deformation, okay? So that is very useful. And even better is that instrument can be heat and cool as well. So you can do stretching, deformation, and control temperature range up to 200 degree and maybe down to minus 70. Again, that's a liquid nitrogen and heating element control. It also has a load cell, so you can measure how much force is in the sample. So you can measure stress strain and uh, as well as uh, morphology at the same time. Here is a real picture and engineering drawing. So let's take a look, real sample. It's pretty simple setup. A glass window lets you see what's inside, a door hinge, 
There is a flange in the back mounted with a large cap tone. That's for creating a vacuum seal. So on a normal condition, this chamber should be maintained at the vacuum. Um, so you minimize air scattering. So this is a stage assembly. It's actually relatively complex. It has a linear stage in X and Z direction. It doesn't have the stage in Y direction. So moving in and out, you're going to change it sample to detector distance. So that stage is menu, which means you can manually lift up. There's a mount. You can lift up and you know, shuffle this whole stage assembly on a rail. Moving in the Z direction is controlled by this Z motor. Um, this is basically a linear motor. You can ask it how high, how low you want to go. It's constantly used to align the sample to the bin. Because the bin, it doesn't move. In the alignment, you move the sample around until the bin hits the sample. And they, we have an X stage here. So this X stage, let me see. Here is probably easy to see, although it's a different angle. But you get the sense. This is the X stage at the very bottom. So X stage moves the sample to the X, Y direction. So what this does is, let me see. Um, so imagine, let me see. This would be the laser. You want to do scattering at this remote. Your X-ray beam doesn't move. So you need to move the sample up and down, left and right, until it's aligned to your center. So that's where these two X and Z stages are used for. We have more complex systems, has also um, rocking motions built in, in our sample stage. So these are alpha and phi angle. So what does that mean? Let me pick a big stab of paper to show you. So now imagine the beam comes from like the laser projector comes towards me. We talked about we can move up and down and left and right. That's Z stage, that's X stage. I don't move this way because then I change for the detector distance. However, in Symphion sample, we also can accommodate two additional motion. That uh, phi angle, let me show you what that means. So being again coming towards me. So I can rock it this motion, OK? Why this is useful? Because this one changes how x-ray hits on your sample and the incident angle. So if I tilt the sample more, we have created a large incident angle. If I tilt backwards, it will be parallel. If I tilt even more, then my substrate blocks the beam, right? You got the idea? We, Sonia, please, you have a question? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that you weren't quite done yet. I uh, thought it was just a question. No, about no problem. The, um, reason why we're doing grazing angles, I know it's because of the use of signal to noise ratio. Yeah. Um, but I'm not quite understanding why that's the case. We're going to go through that in the later part. We okay. do have a quick okay. slides. Um, the other motion I talked about there is rocking and in bin direction. Then there's rocking uh, in perpendicular to the bin direction. So in this way, why we need to do this way? Not necessarily too useful, but our detector is you know a rectangular. We don't want a, a scattering pattern is tilted, right? There's other reasons, but most simple reason is. You want to make the data more easy to analyze. You want a planar um, scattering horizontal. So that's typically we align this. And usually they're pretty good. We're not off by a lot. So we don't change this angle too much, but we align this angle constantly when we do symphony. OK? So that's all the motion available. So it's just a you know, move, rock, tilt, all the possible motions. It's a, this is actually a good one, so let me show you a bigger picture. You know, the nice part of the iPad is I can zoom in. Um, simplest setup is what we have here. As again, I mentioned, X translation, there is a stage here. Z is controlled by here. We do have a little bit 
wine translation, but we typically don't use because it will change STD. This is by a menu manipulator, so you can manually twist a little bit if you like. And here is where I mentioned the, the bottom stage can be made with your sample holder. It's basically sitting on there. You can pull it up and lift it off. Um, for some more advanced setup, we do have the ability to do rotation as well, but it's a separate stage. In a normal setup, we just uh, didn't install this omega rotation stage. So we can actually rotate the sample as 360 degree continuously. And there is a certain reason why you want, why you want to rotate your sample. A good example is when you measure the sample has a strong ion isotropy. So if you have a sample uh, aligned for some reason, either by strain or shear field or other, or magnetic field, then you measuring, your measurement scattering depends on the orientation of your sample to the beam. So a lot of time you want to scatter at the different angles to look at how ion isotropy affects scattering. You can down it manually, but it's really inaccurate, inefficient. You can wrong it, vent to the chamber, and rotate sample by a given degree. But you know nobody does it these days unless you cannot afford a rotation stage. So you're gonna shoot a beam at the sample, then you rotate sample at the define. Let's say, hey, do a 60 degree, measure again, and do another 60 degree and measure again. So again, some of the setup of putting the rotation stage on the top. So instead of a flat, um, you know, uh, the solid state mount stage, you can put a rotation circular stage there. I will show everybody once we are having the lab session. We already covered that. I don't think we need to go too much. This is our detector. It's pretty advanced. Um, I want to point to the fact that they, they market it like you market, sell the detector by how many um, pixels are there. This is the Pilatus 1N, which means roughly there's a million pixels. Uh, but the, it's uh, much smaller here. It's roughly, roughly the same, sorry, roughly the same about 1 million pixels. So why this is important? The pixel tells you resolution you can measure. The more pixel at a given area, you can resolve more fine detail in different peaks. Extremely useful when you measure diffraction, whereas two overlapping peaks might be very close. If you have one pixel, you can only see one broad peak. If you have multiple pixels there, you can resolve the shape of it. So one million was state of the art, the best we can buy at that time. And the, the other one important is sensitive area. The width and height, how physically the wide the detector are, that's about 16 point, uh, 168 millimeter by 180. That's fairly large as well. Um, bigger than, slightly bigger than this piece of paper in one direction, okay? Why? Because this defines your scattering angle. So if you only have the half the size, you miss the higher scattering angle. So the bigger the area, the better. Of course, if you can afford it, because they're relatively expensive. At the time of when we purchased, the detector cost about $250, so 25 cents a pixel. Pretty, pretty good. So the other one they sell is 300K which is much smaller. I only have 30% of pixel um, and 30% of detector area. So that is um, sometimes uh, not ideal. So let me show you. They actually sell, that one is 30%, which means it looks like this. It's an elongated detector, so they can cover a cube, but compared to this nice fancy detector, if you want to collect the same Q range, you need to actually image it three times and stitch the data together. So it's not that efficient. 
You know, what this reminds me actually how people market their engines um, in their, for example, cars and vehicles. They like to put a large batch on their, like, in, in uh, outboard, they like to put 250 there, just tell you this is 250 horsepower. This one end just tell you this is a nice large detector. And latest, latest technology, they can go full and even bigger. Uh, in both pixel, for I mean, there's four million pixels, but the, the detector area are not four times bigger because they squeeze more pixels in uh, area, better resolution. So that one is um, cost uh, also more than what we have. So hopefully down the road we can upgrade to a bigger detector that helps to measure the resolution. And Sonia, you had a question? Yeah, so I know in Spectre I've seen the sample holder or maybe it's that, that blank spot where you're missing a little bit of data. If you were to use the 300K, does that mean that when you had to image three times there would be three locations where there's no data? Um, yeah, so let me show you a little bit. Let me see if I can find a real data point and show you. So this is a good one, play from current. Let's focus just on this image. So what Sonia is talking about, whether it's a blank. Let's relate to how they manufacture the detector. Every, this is similar to your phone camera. So it's made by photolithography, as I mentioned to you. You make, need to make a CMOS circuit. And the problem is the bigger the detector, you are more likely to have a defect in there. And if you're having a certain large amount de a defect, this renders your detector not useful. So there is a certain limit how many dead pixels you can sell in order to claim you are a good detector. I think the specification is we need less than, I think there was 10 data pixel among the whole detector area. Um, that means it's very hard to do. You make a large detector, right? Because you cannot throw it away. So what people make then is by making small modular. So this one particular strip, yeah, this one tenth of this square, is one mini modulus. This was made by them. Then they basically assemble a large detector, putting two by five arrays of them. Okay, so if you have one particular area is pretty bad, then you just need to throw one tenth of the area. You can still use it's improved the yield of their detector. So the 300K is made by the thing. But they, instead of using this, they just pick either in this geometry or they can actually align. In this way, make it longer but narrower. The gap is still going to be there. There is no way you can eliminate it, just how they pack the modules. But the simple way we have the instrument can do is to shift the detector without shifting anything else. You just move the detector offset by angle. So you can image these areas, and then you just need to stitch two sample detector uh, image t together, OK? However, even you shift it, there's still a tiny area going to be overlap. Think about you shift everything here. There's always a dead zone, a tiny bit dead zone left, but majority is gone. OK, so where we are here? We don't need to mention too much about geometry. We already cover what sax wax is, etc. So there is actually two ways we can run for experiment. Either you can run in vacuum chamber. This is, means everything will be pumped the down at about three or four, 10 to the minus three tor or th three millitor, something like that, using a rough pump. It's not ultra high vacuum, but if you have some volatile solvent or you have the sample sensitive to loss of the water, such as hydrogel sample, then you might need to consider ambient chamber. And in this way, everything is basically put in here, and there is a vacuum port on the bottom left corner. You basically pull the vacuum. Um, what we have to do in vacuum? 
The simple reason is it can cut down the air scattering. The air has absorption and scattering. It's weak, but it does not mean it's not there, especially when your chamber is fairly long, has two feet of air in it. So the other way that we can do is minimize the air gap. So you can leave the sample in vacuum, but you want to minimize as, as small as possible. So the second way we can run it is by install two, uh, two nozzles and a cone. So this nozzle has a piece of capstone on the front. And it basically extends the vacuum from the upper string of the main line all the way to extend to here. And the bottom part also extends the vacuum from the detector to this basically piece of cone. So you only left about a few centimeter air gap in between. That's a benefit. You still have some air scaring, but you're trying to minimize as small as possible. So for all the synchrotron beam lines that have been, some of them, um, especially the one made in the 90s, prefer the method on the right, the ambient chamber, just because it's more flexible and easier to accommodate more things. Imagine that some user want to come in and say, I want to measure my own sample on the electrical stress. So it's very hard to pass any electrical wire, if not possible, from the bottom left the chamber. You need to build special ports to, 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 to give feed the throughs, right? On the right, you can just mount it there. It's fine. In other cases like me, I'm doing, in my PhD, we did a lot of solvent vapor annealing. You need to build a solvent chamber and do in situ annealing. That's just harder to do in there. So a lot of synchrotron beam line prefer that way. The, the later part is shiftable. So you can move the, move the fly tube to closer or away, depends on what you want. If you want a larger air gap, you can move everything to the downstream. Here we can do both. If you need to run it in air, we can do it in air, or if you need it in vacuum. Although most of the time we run everything in vacuum. Um, this is some transmission data. I think we already see quite a few of them. Um, just to emphasize one more time. So polyethylene, this is uh, about 500 micrometer thickness half millimeter and using the x-ray energy of what we have, we can pass about 80%, which is pretty good. Well, the same example, you, you could only pass about 50 microns to do the AKV, okay? So that's about 10 times thinner and you can only pass about 60, 70%. And for the solid sample, that's what we have, stage. This is uh, provided to you. This is a capstone on tape. This is a roughly, um, as, as shown in there. Um, it's not that thick. I think the, when, when rolled it, it was uh, much thinner than there. It's typically about 10 mil to 50 mil. So that's right, translate should be about 20 um, to 100 micrometer in thickness for the capstone. So the bulk, if it's self-sustainable, if it's not in powder form, we could just take away these caps and like this piece of paper, we can just put two double side tapes to take to the stage holder. Then you actually have the sample exposed to the beam. There's no wash I need to mount there. It's actually preferred because it, 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 even though we have about 25 micrometer capstone compared to your sample, as I suggest, typically on the order of one millimeter, it's 40 times thicker, but you know you still have two sides of capstone contributed to the signal. If your sample scatter weakly, then in a wide angle scattering region, you certainly will see capstone showing a scattering signal and scattering peak. So if you can eliminate totally, that's preferred, okay?
Um, so that's what the, I think this is what the wax look like for the capital. So it still have some signal if you look at it here, especially that's this crystalline peak coming from the capital. Uh, so this is a, what you're looking at here is a bean stock. I don't think I cover that much for it yet, but it's basically is there to block the direct being hitting the detector. Um, there's um, two reasons we need this. First, it's in our case, the reason is we don't want it to pass through the back capital window. Remember, as I mentioned, there's a, a gap between the, what a file fly tube in the vacuum to detector. We have a, a capital backed by a Kevlar material, so it can sustain the vacuum. But that thing also scatters, so we need to block it before it's exit. That's where this thing comes in. It's circular shape. It's basically a piece of um, metal mounted by a small rods. I'll show everybody when we're in there. And the, that piece of metal is fairly thick. It's about two, three millimeters thick. And that can block any x-ray, attenuate totally. So no x-ray can pass it. And that's where it looked like this, okay? So you, see, you can see there's some signal coming from here. Um, there are several reasons we tend to see scattering signal from low Q. It could be coming from slit scattering, so where the defining slits also sometimes show some weak scattering signal. The air scattering, everything in the beam pass will scatter. Even we put a vacuum, it should be fairly weak, but still a little bit scattering yeah, the bin stop is expected. And last but not least, the capstone. If you have capstone there, it's likely will contribute to signal. And in this case, capstone signal is a majority, okay? So if you in the capstone mount your sample and you want to degree a crystalline calculation, you need to measure capstone first, capstone plus your sample, then use the capstone plus sample to minus capstone signal, okay? Do a couple experiments. In a small angle region, it's more problematic. As you can see, the low Q scattering signal is pretty strong. And you cannot discern if it's coming from your sample or it's from your, your capstone if it's that strong. We, we need to eliminate it. And typically, we just uh, use other low scattering material. Um, quartz is one of them. So this is a picture of our tensile stage on the show here, um, manufactured by Lincoln. If you take away, open this slit's particular cover, you will see what's inside it. It's basically a very nice linear stage. It has two set of uh, linear stage. So the sample will be mounted in the center. They have a load cell, which measures how much force is happening in the sample. Then you can pull the sample in uniaxial, by axial, uh, uniaxial direction at the same time. Um, in the early days, people actually make them just to have one side move, but it's created a potential problem is when a polymer being stretched, the, the, where the being hitting the sample keep moving with it. So now it's very common people design this way. So when you hit roughly a month, it's symmetrically, when stretch, this extends, but the center part almost stay at the same, roughly the same area in the sample. Apparently, I was too conservative. Look at this. They can go down as low as minus 195 degrees, so pretty low. I don't think we achieved that much just because it need to use so much liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen reservoir the one they provided is not that, not that um, particular large, okay? So if you need to know other information, it's right here. Um, this is a heating stage, what it looks like inside. So it's again, it can be mounted directly in two geometry in transmission. Well, in this case, it's the great instance. When you lay it flat, you can put a piece of sample on the top of that copper post. 
this is what it looks like inside. Um, it's basically everything will be loaded on here. There's other feed-through that can purge uh, different gases or different um, environment or liquid nitrogen to heat and cool the sample, but this is where it is. And you can have the stage move a little bit within it to align with the top cover. So it requires fairly little sample to do any type of experiment like this. Um, so this is a one of useful information. The sample area is about a 22 millimeter in diameter. So that's what roughly the diameter of, of this piece. Okay? Your sample cannot be much bigger than that. It can be smaller. Um, here, uh, this is the transmission geometry in liquids. That's the one I talked about. It does not accept the normal capillary, so we need to uh, take the amorphous glass, which is manufactured by a German company and imported by Charles um, Importing Company. They're located in Massachusetts, and that's the only one I think I'm aware of they make this. So this has, uh, makes the diameter about 1.5 millimeter and the wall about, I think this is either 100 microns or 50 microns, okay? That's what it looks like. We have been using them for several experiments, um, not only just a static sample, uh, Luke and Sean are doing some flow cells. If we cut away one end, this is a, the top end is open, the bottom end is not. But you can cut it open to make it a through tube. So in that way, you can flow liquids through the tube and well measure them in, in the liquids. And um, we're going to go through that where we talk about more science example. Here is the, what I was mentioning to Sonia about the same thing sample. So that's a, that's the stage what it looked like. They made it symmetrical, so it looks bottom and top is the same, but with different depths. We typically just do zone, and some of the student mark the where the bing is in the geometry, so that's where you can roughly. Um, know where the beans are, although you still need to do precise alignment, but this roughly, you can put the sample in between these beans and measure it. So why sometimes we doing thin film instead of powder? There's a, a fair amount of science cases where you need that. Um, in my field, we sometimes measure polymer relevant to the device, the device is very thin. We don't need a thick sample, okay? If you're working on more commodity polymer, let's say you made a new polymer, you want to see its crystal structure, then solid state is easy. As long as you can have 10, about yearly 10 milligrams to up to 50 milligrams, you can do powder and you can do bulk. You don't need to do something. And bulk is easy. The signal will be stronger. Just how many material interacting with the beam is much, much bigger than thin fuel. OK? So you might ask the question, why don't we do thin fuel in transmission? So why not just uh, putting a very thin piece of film through the beam? You can. It doesn't mean you cannot. The issue is that. There's little material scatters being. Think about thickness. This is 100 nanometer versus a bulk film. Typically, we're talking about a few millimeter in, in, the, in the beam pass. So you are effectively doing scattering with a stack of sample in the bulk. Um, that causes a problem. The signal will be very low if you do transmission. It's the, the interactive volume, think about it, how much interactive volume you have with the beam, defined by diameter of the beam. In our case, it's about one millimeter. 
in diameter. It's a circular disk. The depth is 100 nanometers, so that's not a lot of volume. Um, however, as I mentioned to you, the same film sample now, instead of going this way, it starts to tilt. And if the beam is still capped at one millimeter, instead of only interacting a small section, now it's scan pass through the whole area, as long as it's in the gradient instance region. Okay? Let me see if I can do an example. So you can see there's x-ray beam hitting on this piece of paper. But once we tilt at the gradient instance angle, maybe you guys should come in after the class, the beam is now elongated in this direction. If you do a gradient instance, it will go through and span through the whole sample area. That's the reason why we need to do it. Um, it, it needed to be still reasonable thick so that you need the sample to be in a range. If you cannot do, you can do a, a nanometer, but still, if even we do in a great instance combined with a nanometer film, there's not a lot of volume. So how do we do this? So we need a smooth substrate. Typically, we, we do it on silicon. I'll explain why we need a smooth substrate in just a second. We need to align the sample so that we know precisely what the incidence angle with the beam. Because when we talk about gradient instance, this is typically on the order of 0 0.1 degree Celsius, 0 0.1 point degree to about 0 0.2 degree. So that's very tiny angle. Um, I don't know why it didn't advance. So first, uh, let's take a look here. What we need to do is first find where the, the zero angle is. This is typically down by rock in the film on substrate. As I showed, I want to use it one more last time. When the beam comes in, how do we define the zero angle or when the beam is parallel to the substrate is crucial. But it's not easy because, you know, it's how can you align something is perfectly parallel at that tiny little scale, right? Um, we have a trick in the x-ray just because if we know the thickness of the where the sample are, when we're rocking it, it creates an interesting phenomenon. When rock is too off a line, then you, your, your substrate is going to block the beam, so the beam is going to get weaker. But if you go through this motion, once you're more and more aligned, you're more parallel, you, there's more beam going to be able to pass through the sample until you start to go other extreme, so your beam intensity. So we just monitor down the string how much intensity in the beam, and looking at the angle, uh, uh, looking at how much intensity versus a uh, rocking angle relationship. The pinnacle of that intensity signals we have a parallel orientation of the beam. Okay, so that's what we do here. It's all taken care of by the software, so you don't need to worry too much. But here is the case. We're going to go through more in the reflectivity measurement, but here is an example. When the sample comes in, when it's past something called critical angle, it starts to go into your sample. But if it's below the critical angle of substrate, it will be reflected. So what is this critical angle? That's the angle need to be above for your beams to penetrate into film. If it's not, just a total reflection. So something like if you go into swimming pool, you dive, then you look up. The water and the air have the critical angle. If you're below that, you only see a reflection of the um, of what outside. Okay. So for a lot of polymer, critical angle is right about 0 0.12 to 0 0.14, depending on density. So that's not too too high. And critical angle increases with electron density. If you have more dense material. It, the angle is bigger. So we are having a lucky situation when we have a polymer film on substrate. We have a window about 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 degree to measure um, this total reflection from the substrate. 
So the beam gonna come in at a reflect angle, then gonna exit, being fully reflect like a mirror at the silicon, and then come out. So this creates a lot of signal. That's why we need to do great instance or symphony. Another important use we're gonna cover is reflectivity. So in this case, we're interested in geometry, but if you are just interested in thickness of your sample or roughness, you can measure how much, um, how much being being bounced back and forth within your uh, solid sample. You can get a very useful information about thickness of your film, okay? You can measure precisely down to sub Enstrom resolution. Pretty good. So this, we actually do a lot of time for polymer in film. In, throughout my PhD postdoc, I did a majority of my experiment in thin film in gradient instant geometry because block of polymer self-assembly is saves the material if you just need to measure on thin film. And for the application for lithography, we want to look at films about tens or twenties and nanometers. So we also do a lot of thin film. So exclusively for thin film, you need to think and consider a uh, great instance. And for the other part is for devices, like when we make solar cells, when we make uh, same film transistors, your orientation and geometry actually changes when you increase the field thickness. The bulk assembly versus same film assembly are different. So that's another reason people look at same film property more carefully if you and the application will be in same film. However, I imagine some of you may not work in this field, but let's say you are a new product development manager, so in, a, let's say, survey, they're developing new plastic. You're more commonly do a bulk, just because how much material they available in, on an industrial scale is much, much bigger. So you typically, either you will generate pallets, or you generate powders, or bulk melt pressed the films, all those are good candidate to do bulk sample, to do in transmission, et cetera. Okay? So I think let's speak to the end of today's lecture. Okay, one, one last slide. How does gradient instance look like in image? We're gonna go, not gonna go into the detail, but I'll only show you what the, it looks like. So this is already uh, half of the detector image. We already throw the bottom half away. And the reason we don't plot the bottom part is, as I mentioned to you, the beam got fully reflected by x-ray, so there's no information useful down there. So we just uh, typically throw them away, plot the top half. And the basic scattering geometry also holds. So your reflection angle is dependent on your Bragg's law, so you can still plot is in Q, in zero, in this case, the wax, we can cover the Q range between the zero and two, and you can see. Our polymer is textualized, that's why it's not a ring anymore, it's just to show some areas that are stronger than the other. If it's isotropic, then you should see a perfect half a ring representing uh, isotropic distribution of the, all, all the crystallites. In this case, all the crystallites are not, so some of them prefer standing up. That's why you see more signal in the standing up direction than in the top um, parallel direction, okay? So that covers all the geometry, especially the, the important part of thin film versus bulk. I am gonna leave some question time. Any anything question for today's lecture? If not, um, let's finish today's lecture. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is now in the next lecture we're gonna talk about block of polymer. I'll post uh, two representative uh, works in the in the in the uh, canvas, saying everybody should take a look, and we can resume this um, this Thursday. Uh, actually, we, let's redo next uh, Tuesday. The Thursday, let me focusing on the um, on the uh, the proposal. I want to make sure I get this still warm 
on my desk. I don't want I don't want everybody to forget about that. I'll, I'll push my schedule and try to finish and uh, give the feedbacks this week for the proposals. Okay, then we meet again next uh, Tuesday for the block of polymer. Sounds good? Okay, let's finish it here.